So I was talking with the customer yeah. and uh, they mentioned that they just recent, recently completed their periodic maintenance mm -hmm. and now are having problems even running a cycle and did a little bit of investigating and that's what prompted me to send you that email with the screenshot of yeah. the vacuum level. Turns out it's so high they can't even get to the point where the heating will kick on. So. That's when I thought it might be good to call you and, and see what we could do next for them. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously the booster pump was running, so it wasn't an issue with anything mechanically not working. And I mean, it just appears like a vacuum leak somewhere and we just a matter of finding it. Right, and, and you know, we talked a little bit, like I said, they recently completed their maintenance yeah. and um, I'm, I'm fairly certain they were calibrating their gauges too. So uh, it seems that a leak check is probably the next step. Yeah. So it was definitely, they had a good leak-up rate the week before, and then they do the maintenance, and then they don't have a decent leak-up rate. Yep, right? exactly, okay. exactly. So, um, you think it's something we'll need a leak detector for? Yeah, of course, we're gonna need that, yeah. Okay, okay, and um, what else we need for that? It's probably some helium, right? We'll need the helium pressure regulator for the helium, uh, the, the gun for spraying the helium. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I think talking with the customer, uh, We've got all that, so okay. let's get started. All right, let's do it. So John, we know we have a leak. What are we gonna to use today to uh, identify the leak? We're gonna use the helium leak detector to do that. Um, the leak detector is like a master chronometer calibrated for helium, and it will be able to detect leaks. Typically, we're gonna start it up. Uh, switch it back here. And it'll just go into a warm-up mode while we do the other connection. Because okay. the leak-up rate wasn't good, that's why we have to do this. We have to figure out what's leaking. Okay, so where exactly are we going to connect it to? So we connect to the pumping system. The pumping system's off right now, so we can make the connection. Okay. All right. So and then we'll go around the furnace, spray helium, and it will travel through the piping to Through the, the piping the system and then in through here. So the master chronometer also has a pumping system in it as well. So yes, since the molecules are so small by the time we're under vacuum, it will pull the helium molecules into the leak detector and find it. Okay, great, great. Because the system is under vacuum, or the pumping system is, I have to release the vacuum before I connect the uh, hoses up to the leak detector. So I usually take the standard KF fitting here. We, almost all of our furnaces have one right above the booster pump. We have the roughing pump and the booster pump, and we want to release the vacuum. Now that I release the vacuum, then I can take the connection. Okay. And we, the same KF fitting, we'll use the original O ring. All right. Bring it right in there, put the clamp around it. And so at this, at this point, then, once you have this connection made, you said the leak detector actually has its own vacuum system. Right. So it will then pull any helium through the system and into itself for detection. Right. I'm going to leave the valve shut when I uh, start the helium leak detector up into the leak detecting mode. And then once it's settled and leveled in, then I'll open the valve after I start the pumping system up. All right, so it's on standby mode, Don. We're just going to hit start and let her warm up. Probably take about 10, 15 minutes and you should be good to go at, as it's pumping down. Yeah, while we're waiting for the leak detector to settle in, we're going to set the flow of the helium Okay. We don't want too much flow because it drifts. The helium is lighter than air and then you'll end up having a big leak somewhere and the helium drifts over and you think you found it, but it's because you had too much flow. Yeah. So I'm just gonna rough it in. I got a uh, pressure regulator. I'll get that kind of close and then I have the flow here. Okay. And then we'll double check in the water. What we want is just a few bubbles and not much. If that's too much, I'll bring okay. the regulator down. And that small little bit of bubbles is all you need. Okay. The problem is you can't feel it. Right. I can't tell that it is, but in the water. I can see. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Don, okay, the leak detector stabilized in test mode, so you go ahead and open that valve slowly. I have to take about 10 seconds to open it. Sure. So 
So here's the leak detector take off like you did because the vacuum levels are different from each other, which is normal. What you heard is normal. Okay. Since the control thermal couple was removed for calibration and replaced, I want to make sure that isn't a leak either. So I'll hit it with the helium around the gland that holds it in. Okay, we're going to start the helium leak check now. Yep. Leak detector's um, warmed up. We've got the pressure regulator set correctly. And we're going to start from the top down. We'll do the highest points and work our way down because of helium lighter than air and it rises. Okay. So we know we have O-rings inside of these. I'll give it a little spray. Yep. And a little spray. Now that's the low vacuum gauge and then that's the partial pressure gauge. Okay. So um, how, how do we know that the gauge is telling us the, the right reading and it's not a gauge or instrumentation problem in this case that could be telling us we have a leak and we really don't? Well, I think they go to a standard calibration here. So um, they would have the gauges taken off. They set it on a, on a controlled vacuum level and they make sure the millivolt reading or the four to 20 milliamp reading is correct. Okay, so basically independent calibration of the gauge. Right, yeah. Okay. And then sometimes you can send them to the manufacturer, they'll calibrate it and ship it back to you. I see. All right, and, and those, those flanges that we're checking now basically just have an O-ring in them still, right. right? Yeah, and if the gauges were removed to be calibrated, there could be a mistake when they reassembled it, which seems to be okay. These are all probably going to be okay, but you still got to go through. So I won't be waiting the normal three or four minutes between each check, unless we actually had a leak, then I would go back and go through them more slowly. Right, right. Sometimes there's contamination during the heating process, outgassing from the metals or whatever oils were on it. Uh -huh. So that's why we add the pigtails in there to help block, help to protect the gauges themselves. Right. Now, is it possible that uh, some of those vapors uh, or, or other materials could work their way into the gauge and get oh, yeah. a false reading? That's the whole reason why a lot of people have them calibrated. Sure. To okay. make sure it hasn't affected the uh, actual real reading of it. Sure. Yeah. And then these gauges are only good to slightly above atmosphere, so we have to have a cutoff valve installed. Mm -hmm. So anytime it goes over atmosphere, this valve shuts to protect the gauges. Okay. So it's here, it's one of these cases where you mentioned a little earlier about potential uh, cross contamination, shall we say, by having too much flow on the helium where you know, the, the flanges being in such close proximity to one another, we could spray at one and end up with helium, say, where your hand is there. And, exactly. And we're really trying to find a leak on the If this the was a large leak, you're absolutely right. If I mm -hmm. spray here, it's going to drift, and all of a sudden your leak detector is going to go off, but it's really not going to be that. Which is a good news because you have a leak, but it's bad news because right. now I don't know where it is, right? Right. And if it was something like that, there's a lot of different methods. We can either tape off the area that we just checked and mm -hmm. then try it again, mm -hmm. and if it's better, then it probably is there. If it's still the same, then it's probably somewhere else. I see. And then sometimes we even bag over it. We'll take a Ziploc bag, cover it, and then put the helium up. Put yeah. the helium up inside the bag. I would imagine like some maybe uh, clay or something like that could work pretty good too, right? To, to well, stick there is the... vacuum uh, yep. for leak checking. They make a special clay for that. Okay. Right, because if you have multiple leaks, you don't want to bring the furnace to the atmosphere and fix each leak one after another. Right. Right. You right. want to get your, through it and get all the leaks taken care of and then fix them in one shot. Exactly. Yeah. Now we typically avoid threads with our furnaces and I see some threads here but I think this was something the customer needed to add for their calibration process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again once the furnace is assembled these rarely are our problem, you know, it's usually during the initial assembly. Right, right. Now inside the furnace we have uh, flaps that open and close and here's the uh, pneumatic actuator that does that. Mm -hmm. So there is a feed-through assembly that has a couple of uh, O-rings and a, a PTFE bushing. And so what we can do to check that is we have a grease fitting on the other side and we have a plug on this side and we do that so when we grease it, the grease can flow out the plug instead of pushing through the uh, O-ring. I see. But you won't really see a leak unless you take it off and then you get the helium right in there. Oh, I see. So that cavity is actually outside of the vacuum 
the, the, the pump down region, shall we right, say. Right, right. So we actually have to take that out and spray some helium in there to check it. Now, uh, you said that's a pneumatic cylinder, right? So that means it's a sliding seal. It's not a, right. it's not a standard O-ring seal. I mean, there is one on the flange, There's obviously. a pair of them, yes, on each side of the um, PTFE bushing. Okay. So all the more reason to check it, because it's right. an actual moving seal. And if the customer doesn't have the ability to have a helium leak detector, sometimes I will manually open and close the valve while I'm pumping down, and if I see a spike in the vacuum, it'll help me lead towards that being the problem. I see, okay. So if that's the case, um, do you have, if, if, let's say for instance, um, you know that there could be a leak at a joint like that. I mean, is there any other way that you can, say, bubble check a joint or something like that, or does it not work too well? Um, you, you could go up to a 10 bar pressure and try soapy bubbles, but that's only going to work if you've got a very big leak. Right. You know, the stuff that we're talking about, you need the helium to really detect it. Right. And then while I'm up here, I'm just going to go ahead and hit the upper part of the door clamp so I get helium in by the door seal. And I'll just follow that around. Okay. And we'll go, we'll clean the door seal in a little bit. Mm hmm And then I see there's a, a cluster of, uh, of uh, they look like thermocouples, right? So yeah, these are feed-through extensions or thermocouple extensions. There's a socket inside the furnace. We do this, so if you want to do surveys, or uniformity surveys, you're not breaking vacuum every time. These are permanent and stay here, right. so you can make your connections without breaking the vacuum. Now I can imagine that those are a different type of seal, right? Because the wire actually extends through the, the, the vessel inside. So each one of those wires is sealed independently, or it looks like they're grouped by threes, right? Um, there's two metal barrels and then a silicone gland. Uh -huh. Okay, and then there's three holes in the two pieces of metal that the thermocouples go through and then when you tighten, the, the extension goes through and yeah. as you tighten the nut down, that presses on the um, silicone and seals it. I see, okay. Yeah. Do those leak very frequently or no? Uh, only usually when you've changed them, which these don't get changed. Later we're gonna do the control thermocouple and that's the one that could be more likely to have a leak. Okay, okay. So that's more of a, once the furnace is in place or unless we have to change them, that's the only time we'd really worry about it. Right. Or if there was excessive handling on the internal side of the furnace. Ah, okay. You know, if they were working, like they removed the hot zone and put it back in, you usually got to pull the whole extensions out of the way inside the furnace, and sometimes working it like that could cause them to leak. Okay. Not common, but it could. Okay. Okay, yeah, I want to show you another important uh, piece of decompression valve, so if you can help me get this guard off. Sure. All right. what we call a decompression valve. Mm -hmm. You know, of course we got the gauges and they tell us it's at atmosphere, but we don't know for sure if it is. So we have a special valve that has to be mechanically opened before the door clamp assembly can open. Okay. And again, that can also leak. So it's just basically a ball valve back here. Uh -huh. And then we just put a cover to keep dirt and junk from going in there. Uh -huh. And so we just want to make sure we always get the helium up in there. Just give it a little spray. Yeah, we're st we still got the helium on. Okay. All right. Usually one of the first things I do is make sure the door seal's clean. Mm -hmm. um, this customer seems to take very good care of his door seal, so we're basically okay. just gonna wipe it down. Okay. If it was in bad shape, we would get alcohol, completely wipe every bit of everything off of it, and then regrease it. Okay. But since this is very well maintained, I just wanna wipe a little of the excessive grease off and on the flange of the, uh, the vessel itself. Okay. If you want to help with that, and I'll go get this here. Sure, be glad to. Yeah, usually the number one problem with a vacuum leak is the door seal. And, you know, we made sure that that was good. And then I joke that the second most common thing is the last thing that you worked on. <laughs> well, that makes total sense, yeah. right? Because every time you use the furnace, what do you do? Open the door, right? Yeah. So that would be disturbed every time. And then, of course, the last thing you worked on always yeah. could be the potential leak. So at least that's a place to start, right? right? Just like we did on the top of the furnace, we gotta move our way down and next will be the vent valve. Okay. The vent valve 
brings the furnace back to atmosphere when it's been over pressure. Go ahead. And because of that, either the garbage from the furnace or if there's any kind of dirt or crud can get in the vent valve or actually coming back down through the pipe. Right. So luckily, um, the customer put in a plug back here so I don't have to separate the flange and I can get a little, well, I'm gonna make sure it's on. Yep, I have helium, all right. Spray a little in there. And we'll have to give it a few minutes. Sure. All right, that gave us a few moments there. Now, obviously the blower motor is identical vacuum as the furnace because they're tied into each other. So we have to power the blower motor so the copper feed throughs are on here. It's just a simple Teflon or PTFE seal with a flange nut that holds it. And there's six of them uh, for the high and low speed. And I'm just gonna hit each one with nitrogen. I mean, with the helium, I'm sorry. Very well. And then we'll have to give that a few minutes. And Yeah. You did tell me they did the full lubrication. They did. Okay. I checked with them before you came. A lot of times there's a problem when they grease them, they get a little dirt on the O-ring in here, and then if you find the leak and you just tighten it, it just crushes it right into the O-ring, the dirt or particle. Sure, sure. So, I'll, you know, the threads I, I hit a little bit, and then the actual compression fitting. Now I'm gonna check the other grease fitting. Oh. Oh. What's that mean, John? We found it. We, we found we it. We got it. That's a good size leak, too. So I brought the furnace to atmosphere, and uh -huh. now we want to take the plug out so we can clean it, because we, we're pretty much sure this is where the leak is. Sure. So I'm going to break it loose. I, I can feel it blowing out, the nitrogen, okay. but it's not enough to cause anything, so we're good. Oh, oh man. Oh, well, look at that. Yeah. Okay, well, now we got to take the O-ring off, but... Right, hey, yeah, get, there it is. Boy, yeah. that's a pretty big chunk of dirt. Yeah. All right, we'll get rid right. of that, and then... Gently, we, gently pop it out. You said it should come out pretty easy. We don't want to catch the. Oh, looks like there's some other dirt on there too. Okay, let me uh, get a little alcohol here and clean the O-ring itself. Now I'm going to take a little of the Molly Coat 111 for the grease. Some people use high vacuum grease. Both are absolutely fine. Yeah. And the, the key here is is that we don't want a lot of grease, I wouldn't right. imagine, right? Nope, nope, just enough to lubricate it. And it also helps it stay into place a I'll little bit. I'm going to um, make sure the hole is clean, the threads look good, but I will take an extra wipe to be sure. I'll double check one more time, looks good. And that should wrap it up. Do you remember what the micron was before we found the leak? I think it was about 70. Okay. I just look, we're at four micron now, so I'm pretty confident we took care of the problem. Okay, but we're checking just in case, yeah, right? You have to, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, all we're really doing is repeating what we did before. We sprayed it with helium again. And now we wait for a minute or so just to see if the leak detector responds, right? And it would have responded by now because last time it did it in like about three seconds. So we're confident now we've got the leak fixed. Yeah. Okay. We got it. So when we got here, we, could, we couldn't get under 70 micron for ultimate vacuum. Okay. And then after we found the leak, we can easily get down to under five micron. All right, so that definitely was the leak now. Yeah. yeah. And then just doing a real simple leak up rate we're doing we're roughly around 20 micron an hour uh -huh. without a burnout so the customer will need to do a burnout probably tonight or whenever he has his normal schedule for it all right and that goes back to what you mentioned when we were cleaning the door seal that some moisture can absorb into the hot zone right. and it needs to be evaporated basically out of the furnace and then yeah. we can or start over some again. people call it outgassing yeah, yeah. outgassing yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, and then, and then the, the leak check actually happens in what way? What's the typical process for that, or procedure? Well, typically you do your burnout cycle, which would be a couple hundred degrees Fahrenheit over your standard process. Okay. And then you do a, you soak for two or three hours, and then you do a vacuum cool. Mm -hmm. And then when the valve's shut at the end of the vacuum cool, then you check your rate of rise. Okay, and the rate of rise is what we're really looking right. for, right? Right, right, that's true. Yeah, you're true leak up rate. And given this, we're expecting that to be back in the, what? We'll be under five micron an hour. Five micron an hour, yeah. which is our target. Right. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for your help. Hey. I know that there was, they were struggling for quite some time, so uh, glad we could clear it up for them. Yep.
it was 